All right, good evening, everybody. And welcome to our next class in Jewish history. Um, sorry about last week. It's been uh, weather changes affect my head, unfortunately, and it was not a good one last week. But Bar Hashem back in the saddle and uh, happy to teach. Um, I want to start off with something strange. Not the first time I do something strange in this class. Some of you are already familiar with this. There's a poem. <coughs> sorry. Poem written by John Godfrey Sachs called The Blind Man and the Elephant. And it basically is about blind people who are taught, who are told to touch an elephant and tell you and explain what it is, what they, so to speak, see. So you'll see, if we look around like this, the guy that's on the top, who's by the ear, says it's a fan. The one who's standing by the, the one who's standing by the uh, tusk says it's a spear. The one that's by the trunk over here says it's a snake. The one that's standing by the leg, it's a tree. The one that's standing on the side says it's a wall. And the back says it's a rope. And at the end of the poem, he says, I have it here, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong. Though each was partly in the right, all were in the wrong. Okay, what's this? It's, it's a mashal. What is this meant? It's a parable. What's it meant to be? That if you look at something with blinders on, if you look at something through what we would call a keyhole, not looking around what else is going on, then you really miss the whole point. You miss the whole picture. So the guy, for example, on the extreme left who says it's a spear because all he sees, so to speak, in quotes, he touches is the tusk. He misses the whole point of what the elephant really is. Why am I mentioning that? Because when we learn Jewish history, and I know I mentioned this in our first class, I'm pretty sure, when I was growing up and uh, probably almost into my years of high school, I believe that when the Jews were in Egypt, there were absolutely no other people in Egypt. That was it. Just the Jews were enslaved. The world revolved around the Jews, that, which wasn't true. They were there were other slaves in Egypt at the time. Egypt was the powerhouse of the of the world. It was the world's main source for horses. It was a very interesting country. Um, but there was much more going on in the world besides just Jews being in Egypt. And if we want to talk about Jewish history, <clears throat> we have to take into consideration. Two parallel tracks that are happening. One that we briefly talked about, which is Christianity. We're going to come up to that again in the late 11th century. Um, but right now we're going to talk about tonight. Doo, 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 doo. Let me make it back to normal size. It'll be all over. The birth of Islam. Why the birth of Islam? Why do we need to know anything about this? Because if we don't know about, <clears throat> sorry, the birth of Islam, we don't understand how it interconnects with Judaism early on, then we're going to miss a part of Jewish history, which to, unfortunately, as we know, affects us till this very, literally to this very day, to this very hour. Um, it's If we were to leave out Christianity and Islam from Jewish history, we're doing what it so shows in that, in that picture. It's a toss, it's a spear, it's a, it's a snake, it's a fan, and that's not a good way to look. So we have to take it. So tonight's class is going to be about the birth of Islam. Now, obviously, this can be a whole series of classes, but that would be if it was a, a history of Islam. It's not. This is about a little bit we need to know uh, about the background, Muhammad's interaction with the Jewish people, and how that changed. Um, and then eventually we'll see how that affects us on a daily basis. So what I want to talk about, we know that early on, around 2,000 years ago, that there was a, a, a split of the Jewish people. They're originally Jews, Jesus and his followers and, and everybody else. And eventually it takes a couple hundred years and there's a, there's a complete break. The main, we talk about this, that one of the main catalysts for the messianic concept that appears in early in early Christianity was the, the Bar Kokhba revolt, the belief that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah, and they took it and ran with it. And uh, I'm not, again, I'm not being very specific about Christian history because that's not the point here. And then a few hundred years later, we have just come to the end of the time of the Talmud. We said that at the end of the, of the Babylonian Talmud. 
And that comes to an end in the early 500s, around 520, 530. The very next generation, which we'll talk about Bezrat Hashem next week, is a very tiny little bridge between the Talmudic period, which is known as the Amoraim, and then the Ge'onim, which we're going to talk about, is a period of anywhere from 30 to 100 years called the Savoraim. I briefly touched on them before, but the, we're going to talk about now is concurrent with the history of time of the Savoraim. So what I'm talking about now is the later, just after the end of the Talmudic period, the end of the Amoraim, and into the time of the Savoraim, and a little bit into the Ge'onim. Again, we haven't really talked about them yet. We don't really know exactly when Jews ended up in the Arabian Peninsula. But what we do know, this is a, this is a, a map of the Arabian Peninsula, Persia, the Haino, um, Babylonia, Persia, um, and Arabia. What we do, I circled in yellow two main, three main places. One is Medina in the north, Mecca further south, and then the country of Yemen. The reason that I've circled them is as follows. We know that by the middle of the fifth century, which means the middle of the time period of the Talmud, the time of the Amorayim, the Gemara time, we already know that some Jews are found in the southernmost area of, of the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen. So Yemen, the Taimani Jews come from, from, from Yemen. Um, so we already know that. We don't know exactly when they started migrating to that area. The why we saw already, we saw that there was the breakdown of Babylonian Jewry over, where did we get that here? Over here. And they, they need to find new new uh, place to live. And somehow they make their way down all the way to Yemen. But by the 6th century, about 100 years later, um, Jews are already found in Mecca and Medina. And that's going to be a very important part of the birth of the Islamic uh, religion, which was not called Islam at the beginning. We'll see. Um, the it what interesting is that that time period of history in Arabia, um, <coughs> the population was divided. Still, was very much a tribal people. Now, the Jews were at one point until the destruction of, of the Beit Hamikdash. Uh, even the second one, for the most part, um, were were a a uh, um, a tribal people. You know, we have tribes. You have the Shevet Dan, Shevet Ruvain, Shevet Levi. But this part of the world in Arabia was very common. It was the people who lived in a very tribal type of an environment. And um, about this entire land mass was about six tribes, which when you think about it is a lot of land for a small different groups. Now, at this point, the Jews, because they have come from Babylonia and are considered educated, even though there's already a diminution in the level of knowledge by this point, but in the early 400s, mid 500s, there's still a decent amount of knowledge uh, among the Jewish people. Um, and the, their, their neighbors, the, the Arabians, we'll call them the Arabians, um, their, their level of knowledge was not very good. Um, and the Jewish Arabians, their their knowledge was even low was even lower than the ones coming from Babylonia. So the ones that started over here migrated down to this area, Mecca and Medina. There was people here. Their their level of knowledge is going down. And as people start migrating here, there's there's some people with good knowledge coming into an area with lower level knowledge. At this point, comes onto the scene a man named Muhammad. Uh, his childhood, his youth, is for the most part most part spent here in Mecca, over there. Um, here he was actually a very poor individual, and he was, um, this area of Mecca was a stronghold actually for some very powerful and rich uh, Arabian or Arab tribes. He again was, came from a very poor background, and he would have obviously loved to be part of this richer uh, area. Uh, he was a camel driver. He moved his way up to own a, um, a leader of a pack of camels and eventually bought his, his owners, the owner's business. And therefore he became a businessman and he owned a fleet of camels. Now it's like, what do you need camels? Well, camels at the time were like only a, a car dealership in a sense, or a, a, a car manufacturing location. 
as he starts to travel around more in, in the area of Arabia and beyond, and people come to him for trading purposes, he becomes familiar with the two religions that are in the world at this point. He becomes familiar with Judaism and Christianity. And he wants to start to understand a little bit more of each of these of each of these religions. He's more impressed with Judaism than he is with Christianity because something spoke to him. The concept of, of, a, of a monotheistic religion, believing in, belief in one God, and not in the concept of the Trinity of the Christians, spoke to Muhammad more. He found he connected to that idea even better. And then he starts on this, and again, I'm not here to give you the whole background. He was... He was a philanderer. He was probably a child rapist. He was he did a whole bunch of bad things. He was a very, 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 very bad individual. This one, this person they refer to as their prophet was a horrible individual. In any case, he claimed that he had a revelation that he went on his donkey up to heaven and God, Allah, revealed himself to him, gave him all kinds of prophecies. And through an angel, he was then instructed to write down. And at that point, of course, we know he he comes out with this, the book known as the Quran. And that's kind of a bunch of history in, in two sentences. Now, one of the gigantic, if you learned Kuzari, and we have in the past had classes in Kuzari, one of the, you'll note that one of the giant differences between the three major religions in the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, has to do with the revelation. Christianity believes, of course, that, that Jesus rose from the dead, that a handful of people saw him, and and he he's uh, another word of God, and everything else comes to him, etc. And, and Muhammad is literally alone. He comes and declares himself a prophet of God, the last prophet, saying that that the people come before him and Jesus, and I shouldn't even say the names in the same sentence. The Moshe and Jesus and Abraham, they were all prophets, but he is the greatest of all prophets, and will always be the greatest of all prophets. Sounds kind of familiar when we talk about Moshe, but what they what but again, with Muhammad, it's a revelation of one person. No witnesses, no anything. What happens to Judaism? We know that millions of people, even putting aside the Midrashim that say that all of our Nishamot and future Jews and big converts and everyone were at Har Sinai, <coughs> just the amount of people who were there to witness the actual giving of the Torah on Har Sinai were the millions of Jews. It's a very big difference. And again, the Kuzari discusses how the 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 debunking, so to speak, of the idea that there would have been a revelation to one person who then came out and talked about a revelation to another person who came out and talked about it, versus millions of people. For those of you who are not familiar with Rabbi Daniel Mechanic, spelled just like a car mechanic, uh, he's a speaker who goes all over the world. He's hysterical. He's fabulous. He's brilliant. He's a great speaker. Um, he speaks for Aish around the world. And he has this many, many lectures he gives. He also used to speak to Hollywood stars and, and, and crowds that are just people you would never ever contact with. And he has topics such as, how do we know we're right? How do we know we're right? Judaism is talking about, obviously. If you have any, if you have any time at some point, just go into YouTube, type in Rabbi Daniel Mechanic, and look at some of his YouTubes, YouTube videos. They're, besides being very entertaining, You'll learn quite a bit, and specifically about this whole idea of the difference between Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and as far as the uh, revelations. And I use that partially in quotes, obviously. The religion takes on the name of Islam, but early on, the if which comes to the word peace, which is uh, which is obviously a uh, what's the word euphemism nowadays, because uh, it's the farthest thing from it, unfortunately. Um, the, the adherents were, were called Muslims or Muslim, but the original name of the religion was Mohammedism. Uh, Mohammedism was named, obviously, for Muhammad. Mohammed, Mohamed, Mohammedanism is actually what it was called. And he starts to do is he starts to preach his ideas. And he wants to preach his ideas of, again, it's immaterial right now. We're going to look a little bit at what their basic tenets are soon. But it's immaterial what he's preaching because it has nothing to do with us right now. But what does have to do with this is what he includes within his teachings in order to attract the Jewish people. We're going to get to that shortly. 
Um, the problem for him is he's teaching these things in the city of Mecca, where he's living, and he's actually being driven out of the city. He's being driven out of the city because he's trying to proclaim this new faith, and they didn't want to hear from it. So he runs from Mecca to Medina, right? From Mecca over here to Medina. The reason I'm pointing that out is this a critical, critical piece of history, which is that is called, um, I think I have it here on the screen. Yeah, it is in the year 622 and was called the Hijra, not the Hajira, not, not the, it's the Hajira, the, the, is, the Hajira is another way of spelling it, is the flight. He runs in the year 622 from here, Mecca, to Medina, because his life is in danger over here as he's trying to spread this new religion. In Islam, that year, 622 of the Common Era, is known in the Islamic calendar as the year one. So if you would take 2024 and subtract 622, you get what their calendar year is of the Muslim calendar. It's known as the Hijra, Hijra, or the flight, because he's fleeing, he's fleeing Mecca to Medina. Now we know, you're, I'm sure you already have some knowledge, that both of these cities are considered holy, and especially Mecca. We're going to see how, how that becomes even more holy in their religion in a, in a, in a few minutes. Now, let's let's kind of switch the picture here for a little bit. <clears throat> Muhammad expected the Jews uh, to have an appreciation of his new religion more so than the Christians. He referred to the Christians as pagans and felt they would not be attracted. And therefore, what he tried to do was to include in his book of laws and in his Quran things that would be attracted to the Jews. What does that mean? It meant that he was going to try to in, in, uh, initiate rules and regulations that would be familiar to the Jewish people. First of all, uh, he wanted it to be a, a moral religion, now, which is really hysterical since he was a very immoral individual himself. Um, but he did things, <clears throat> um, the idea of banning alcohol, the idea of ban da banning pig. Again, the banning pig because he felt that he was known among the Jews as being one of the worst things, even though it's not, believe it or not, one of the worst things. He said, I'm going to make these ideas that are going to bring the Jews. They're going to say, oh, there's some familiarity here. I'm going to join the, the religion of, the, of, of Islam. Interestingly enough, if you read the Quran, which I've only read a few uh, sentences of because of needing certain pieces of information, you will find a, a contradiction in Muhammad's approach to the Jewish people. You will find some sentences that are very open and welcoming to the Jewish people, and some, whereas probably one of the most famous ones you've heard of, is where the trees will say that, oh, come, oh, Muslim, and there's a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. So which is it? Was he nice to the Jews? Did he like the Jews? Or did he hate them and hate their gods and want to kill them? The answer is yes. What does that mean? He was very frustrated because in the beginning, he wanted to, as I say, to bring them in, bring them into the fold um, and made these part of his rules and regulations think that the Jews would be familiar with. When he saw they were not cooperating, he turned on them. And the whole direction then the rest of the Quran is against the Jewish people and against anybody who is not um, is Muslim. Uh, and they're referred to, as we know, infidels. I don't know if I've mentioned this before or not, but it's a good thing to know. Judaism is the only religion that I'm aware of. Now, I can't tell you I know every single religion in the world. But in the main religions that exist, that believes that you can be a member of a different religion and still go to what we call heaven. Jews believe that Christians can go to heaven if they live a moral, decent life. They believe anybody can. Muslims, Christians, others, you're damned to hell if you do not follow the, the religion um, stated. You know, you, you don't follow your own, the religion of, of Islam, you don't follow the religion of Christianity, whatever it is, you're, you're toast as far as they're concerned. Um, I want to just take a quick look here, a couple of comments that came in. Medina, the way we pronounce the country, Medina, means city in Arabic. Thank you very much for that, Suzy. And since Islam, yes, I was coming to that. Uh, Chava was mentioning uh, in a comment since Islam does not correct for the solar year, wouldn't you have to add a year for thir every year for 13 years? So six yes, I'll coming back to that in a minute. But thank you to get the correct Muslim year. In other words, since they don't correct for it, 
So actually, if you do take a look, what if you Google, I, to Google, I was going to actually tell you to try this after the class. You can do it during here. Um, to, to Google, what is the Muslim year? It's not going to work out by taking 2024 minus 621. It's not going to work out because they don't have a leap month. Since they have a, a, a solar calendar, we have a solar slash lunar calendar. And we adjust like we just are in the process of now with the leap year, having an extra month of Adar. They don't. That's why Ramadan came now in March. A couple of years ago, it was in June. Before that was July. And it, it works its way through the the, uh, the calendar year. So yes, you are correct. Um, <coughs> what happened though with the Arabs? We talk about the Jews. What about the Arabs? So the Arabs end up joining him in great numbers. And over the time, he is strengthened by the large Arab numbers of Arabs. And before Muhammad died, uh, before Muhammad died, um, 10 years after his flight from Mecca to Medina, the, the basically the entire Arabian Peninsula that you saw a map before, were their, their, their motto would be Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet. In a very, very, very short period of time, the Arabian Peninsula went from being pagans or no religion, having a smattering of Jews, almost very few Christians, to being overrun by Islam and the uh, religion and the, 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 the teachings of Muhammad. Before one more century passes, it spreads as far as to Persia. Let's go back, take a look back at the, uh, the screen. It goes, it spreads to Persia. It spreads to, to the land of Israel, which we, at this time we say Palestine, unfortunately. It says it, yeah, Palestina, and it, whether it's going to be called Palestine, it's going to be Galilea Capitolina, or it's going to be called Al-Quds, or it's going to be Yerushalayim, uh, the city of many, many names. Judaism, Judaism has more than 70 names for it itself, so whatever. In any case, um, so it now spreads from uh, between Mecca and Medina, and um, over through Persia, to the land of Israel, it's growing very fast at this point, only a few years after the death of Muhammad, before even a hundred years, another hundred years passes. Again, keep in mind concurrently what's happening in the Jewish in the Jewish timeline. We have now just passed the time period of the Savo Raim, which we're again we're going to talk a little bit about more, even though I think I talked a bit last time on it. <laughs> and then into the, the time of the Gaonim. People like Rav Hai Gaon, Rav Shvira Gaon, Rav Sadia Gaon, names that may sound familiar to you. So we're just now entering that time period when the Islam is exploding in this part of the world. Um, the Ro What about the Roman Empire? So the Roman Empire, which was massive, is starting to implode, to disintegrate. And many of the Romans, the Roman Empire has taken on the religion of Christianity, becoming the, its official religion. But it's starting to shrink as Islam is starting to grow. During the approximately 400s and 500s, um, the area in the land of Israel is becoming less and less populated with Jews and more and more Christians. We already saw this when we talked about the Talmud and we talked about the difference between the, the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. Um, why one became more authoritative is again, because there were many, many, many less Jews and therefore scholars living in Israel. What was there, the growth... Christian was starting to grow. Christianity was starting to grow. There were still Jews there. There were still synagogues there. There were schools there. It's not like there was no Jews, God forbid, but it was a much smaller um, community. Um, okay. Okay, let me take a look at something else here. Okay, this will give you a fairly good picture of what Islamic conquest looked like in the next couple of hundred years. Remember, it starts only over here. Mecca is where he's born and raised. Here's where he runs to, Medina. When his religion, he declares his religion of Islam, it's over here in Medina. It starts to grow. It then goes down to Mecca and then encompasses a large part of Arabia. 
And by the end of the ninth century, the, in the 800s, now that's already deep into the time of the Gaonim, look where it goes from. From the top, from Northwest Africa and the, the, the Iberian Peninsula, all the way to India, all the way up into China, all the way up into here. And for those of you who remember the story of the Kuzari, that's up here, actually. The Khazars, the Khazaria Jews. We're not going to get to that tonight. Um, we'll talk about them down the road. So it's massive. Now, if you remember the the what was called the Holy Roman Empire, which they say was not either holy nor Roman nor an empire, that consisted of the area over here. Now it's called the Byzantine Empire. We're not again. This isn't a world history class. It's a Jewish history, but just for comparison's sake, um, look at the massive amounts of area that has taken over during the course of series of series of years um, after Muhammad dies. It was extremely, extremely fast. The the um, the course you would think in history of a hundred years is a blip. If you go back in time to this, even before this time period in history, go back to, let's say, 100 BCE, 200, 500, 100 years, is, there's not a lot of growth that's going on. We know that as time goes by during history, things get much faster. 100 years now, 100 years, let's say from the year 1924 until the year 2024, where we're holding now, it's a massive, massive sea change in the world of the uh of change when it comes to whether it's computer revolution industrial revolution so many things that have happened the combustion engine all these big things communication travel in the last hundred years alone but go back a few hundred years a hundred years child uh, one century was not a lot of big change so it's even more amazing this 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 very fast growth and what was the attraction all you have to ask that i don't know but it did go very fast, sometimes by force and sometimes not by force. And as we know that uh, much of Islam tries to convert by force. And unfortunately, we see it in our own time. So therefore, in less than 100 years after Muhammad, uh, half of the um, the land, this here, like I say, was already taken over by, by Islam and, and it grows and grows and grows. Very nice. What about Judaism and Muhammadism or Islam? What was it that, going back now for a minute, that um, Muhammad felt that Islam had to offer the Jewish people that they didn't already have? Um, the Jews could not claim lay claim to any kind of great cultural tradition necessarily, right? Um, so maybe they can offer them culture. Maybe they can offer them things that they didn't have within their own within their own uh, within their religion. Again. It, it's immaterial right now what it is they felt that they could offer, but just understand that he was trying to get converts, trying to get people to become uh, followers of him, meaning Muhammad, the quote, prophet. They established a code of laws, and the code of laws was called the Pact of Omar. What was the Pact of Omar? A Jew and Christian who remained in the land that were ruled by Islam were forced to follow a certain new set of laws. It was to make it very, very clear who was the balabait, who was the who was the landlord, and who was the <clears throat> the tenant. It had to do with taxation. It had to do with their station and what they could do and could not do in their communities. Um, someone who would speak disrespectfully of Muhammad, um, it could be a death penalty. <laughs> Not like we haven't seen that to this very day. Um, they also, um, the taxation was on communities. No new synagogues could be built. A synagogue could never be higher than a mosque. Um, a, I have a list here. I'm going to tell you a couple more things. It says um, they could not own swords. A Jew could not own swords. They could not ride on a horse. They could only ride on mules. Horses were considered more more honorific and also higher higher up literally and then figuratively as well um and here's something you probably never heard in any jewish history non-muslims had to be dressed 
that they were distinguishable from Muslims. <clears throat> they had to wear a, I don't know how they thought about this in modern times, but they had to wear a yellow patch on their sleeve and a yellow head covering to identify themselves as Jews. I want to explain something that may not be very clear. I might be a little sarcastic about it, but it's serious. When we get to talking about World War II down the road, and we'll talk about the Nazis, Yamach Shemam, and all that they did, and the Nuremberg Laws, and all these other things they did, there's almost nothing they did that wasn't done before. Whether it was, except in the greater the scale that they did it on. But whether it was the yellow patches, or that it was the, the laws passed against what a Jew could and could not do, um, They've been been there, done that. It's been done to Jews for for centuries. The dimi, d h i m m i, I think it's spelled. The lower caste, the Jews, they were lower. Um, when we, as as a people of a sovereign nation, bow, so to speak, to the world of Islam, I'm talking not literally but figuratively. <clears throat> um, we are acting like dimi instead of a, a sovereign country. Um, but this idea of separation like that is then taken over later when the Christians um, do some major conquests and have a lot of land. That will be taken of these ideas of the separation of the Jew, both physically as far as location where they're allowed to be, such as ghettos, which is a word taken from Italian, which we'll get to one day, um, or the kind of clothing you have to wear. All this, is this, all this goes back to the early time period of the, the rise of Christianity and Islam. If you take a look on the internet, I decided not to do it. I'll just tell you about it. I'm sure you've seen pictures where they have to wear certain kind of hats, pointy hats, or like I say, the colored clothing, or the regular clothing with the patch. All these things just to say, Jew, you did, right? I, when I was a kid, I first started learning a little bit about the Holocaust by accident because it was definitely not taught in school yet. Um, and I started to see the first couple of movies of a Holocaust. And see the star with the word J-U-D-E. I didn't know it was German. So I asked my parents, what's a, what is Jude? Um, so, you know, all of us learned and came to the, the Holocaust uh, in our own way. But the, the, the same thing is true when you go back to this time period. It wasn't a Holocaust. Definitely not. Um, but things for the Jews as they ebb and flow during our history, whether it will become when we get through the Crusades and all, things don't turn out well for us. When the people who think that they are more holy and more special and that we're nothing act on that. But let's take a look at, um, I, I already mentioned this, that we're talking about the same time period of the Gaonim and before that, the Savarayim, the growth of Islam. I just want to mention briefly this, this screen, because I think it's important for us to know that one of the things that Islam does, did, was again, in order to great, gain followers from Judaism, some of what they do is actually based on Judaism. And by the same thing is true with Christianity, when you talk about the idea of baptism, uh, that, that's the idea of the havdil, the idea of a mikvah, all kinds of, uh, of things. So they have these, I'm probably going to mispronounce them, but who cares? Shahada, which is faith, that's the faith in what? Not just the fact there's one God, but the faith that Muhammad is the greatest prophet of all time. By the way, if a person, God forbid, were to want to convert to Judea, to um, Islam, uh, as opposed to Judaism and even somewhat in Christianity, but in Judaism, where there's a whole process that takes a long time, uh, when it comes to Islam, it's pretty quick. You can, you, in and out, it's like a drive through. All you have to do is accept Islam and Muhammad is his prophet, and you're good to go. Um, you accept Allah. Then you have Salah, which is prayer. Now, we, as you know, of course, we dab them three times a day. They pray five times a day. We're going to talk about the direction in a minute of which way they face. They have, I don't know how to pronounce this next word, Sawam fasting. That's the month of Ramadan, which we're finishing up now, thank God. And then they come to the their three-day holiday known as Adolf Hitler. I mean, Adolf Hitler, um, which is their holy days, um, which, uh, which is coming up. Again, the concept of fasting. Also coming from us, zakat, like tzedakah, the idea of giving charity to the poor. And then the last one is called hajj. Now you remember when I, I told you that when, when Muhammad goes to Mecca, to Medina, that flight is called the hijra, hijra. It depends on how, how you spell it and pronounce it. But the hajj is something else. Hajj should sound familiar to you because it's the same word as in Arabic as chag. Chag means 
holiday. Actually, it doesn't, but that's how we use it. Um, and what is that pilgrimage? So let's take a look at the next screen. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with this picture. This is the Kaaba. The Kaaba is this massive stone in Saudi Arabia and Mecca that is considered the holiest place to Islam. And if you want to know more background on the Kaaba, you can feel free to look it up online. Um, what the requirement in Islam is that a person has to make their hajj or pilgrimage to the, the, the Kaaba once in their life. They have to do that. Where'd that come from? Surprise, Judaism. How? What do we have as a requirement in Judaism? In the time the Beit HaMikdash stood, we had what was called Aliyah. We shouldn't even put it in the same breath, but Aliyah Regal, that during Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot, the Jew had to go to Yerushalayim, to go to Harabai, to go to the Temple Mount, to see and be seen. They would bring a special korban, a special sacrifice called korban olat re'iya. They would have to bring a special korban. So the idea of a pilgrimage, again, is borrowed from, borrowed, stolen from Judaism, and but it has a different purpose. When they come there, um, they have this whole process. They, they circle the, the Kaaba, and then they are dressed in white, and they throw a stone at the Kaaba, the purpose being to get away the devil, get away the whatever it might be. So they have all kinds of interesting customs. Um, some of them, unfortunately, are not very good for the Jews. So, um, just to kind of summarize, the birth of Islam has a, in early days, a minimal effect on Judaism. The Jews more or less um, do not get sucked in to this new religion, much more get sucked into Christianity, but not so much into Islam. At this point, other than the taxation and they have to dress a certain way, there's not a lot of downside or negative things happening yet for the Jewish people. It will play a big role later on when we come to about a thousand years from now, from there. Uh, but we're going to talk about a couple of people who were false prophets, false messiahs, the Shabbat Tzvi, who people thought he was the messiah. It turns out he ends up converting to, to Islam at the end of his life. All kinds of interesting things. But as you know, um, the, the religion will not turn out to be very good for the Jewish people in the long run. Okay, um, next week, I'm going to go back and talk just briefly again about the Savarayim, which we talked about already, just to kind of bridge that again, and then get into the time of the Go'onim. The time of the Go'onim will last for a few hundred years, similar to the time period, or even longer, than the time period of the Talmud, the time of the Amorayim. And you'd think, like, wait a second, we have the Mishnah, which Rabbi Yudanas, he edited, we have the Gemara, both the one from Bavel, Babylonia, and the one from Israel, the Jerusalem Talmud, more or less, at least the Babylonian one was nicely edited. What else do we need? What else do we need? <clears throat> the answer is a lot. Um, and that's where we're going to come talking about the go, time of the go. Um, that, and that'll take us some time. In the meantime, um, I want to tell us, wish everybody a good evening. Um, get together again next Tuesday and next Tuesday will be the last class until after Pesach uh, any class Sunday, Tuesday and Thursday I have next week will be the last series of classes and then we'll continue again after Pesach um, so if you have any time, <clears throat> reminder go online, take a look at videos from Rabbi Daniel Mechanic, they're fascinating funny and inspirational um, take a look if you want to know anything more about Islam, about look, look about the Kaaba, you can look about their five pillars uh, if it interests you um, and that's it. That's all I have for tonight. And again, wish you all a good evening. Be well, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh